<clears throat> well, firstly, thank you, John, for redoing the talk that you carried out on the 12th of January in Oakham Castle, which was so successful. We've asked you to record it for our online engagement for the History Society. Um, John has kindly come back and um, he's in his house and I'm in mine, so um, I think there's no, no further ado. Um, John, if you could give us your excellent talk on George Glover, please. Thank you, Debbie. 176 years ago, next month, a 35-year-old architect was languishing in Norwich jail, having succumbed to debts related to railway investments. But as we will see later, it may have also been a problem with the proprietor of the Stanford Mercury, Richard Newcomb. The architect was George Glover. He was born in 1812 in York, the grandson of a nail forger and the son of a Freeman Whitesmith trading out of Goodrum Gate in York. His elder sister married Joseph Aloysius Hanson. Hanson was another architect specializing in Catholic ecclesiastical work, but he was also the inventor of the Hanson cab. George and his siblings were well educated. The sister Hannah went to a ladies seminary and his younger brother became a surgeon. Unfortunately, we don't know how George Glover was architecturally trained, although we will see later that he was classically trained. However, it's possible that his brother-in-law, Joseph Hanson, had a role in his training or may have placed him with another architect. But we do know that Glover worked for an architect called John Brown on plans for a new chapel in Lowestoft in 1832. John Brown went on to be quite a famous architect in his own right, specialising in ecclesiastical work, but on Anglican churches. Brown was working out of London from 1826 to around 1832. And when he returned to Norwich, he became the Norfolk County Surveyor in 1835 and Surveyor of Norwich Cathedral in 1836. We know that Glover was involved in the uh, work on Lowestoft Chapel because on the left, you will see a grant application written by Glover on behalf of the vicar and the plans to the right uh, were also drawn by Glover. And we know this because the handwriting and the work on the plan corresponds with Glover's later work. Meanwhile, in Stamford, the vicar and church wardens of St. Michael's Church on the High Street were considering um, enlarging the internal uh, part of the church to enable more pews to be fitted. They took on architect Thomas Pilkington and builder Thomas Boyfield. And this is the plan that was approved for the work. You can't see clearly here, but there are four pillars. And if I expand those pillars, you can see the two here, but these two at the bottom are marked with the number one. And the one refers to a note below, pillars to be taken down. But the inevitable happened. And sometime later, as they started work and removed the pillars, St. Michael's Church crashed to the ground. It was John Brown of Norwich that won the contract for the rebuilding of St. Michael's Church. And this is the last page of a five page proposal to the building committee and church wardens. You can see that it was signed by John Brown, but the actual letter was written by George Glover, who by now must have become clerk to John Brown in Norwich. 
Glover also drew up the plans for the new church. And when it was completed, it looked like this, and it still looks like this today. Unfortunately, it's been deconsecrated and the ground floor is now Boots the Chemist. But here you can see Queen Victoria riding up the high street and swooping right into Maiden Lane on her way to Burley House. So the rebuilding of St. Michael's Church involved these people. The architect John Brown, as I've mentioned, George was also appointed Clerk of Works. And he would have worked closely with the building committee on which sat Richard Newcomb, the owner of the Stamford Mercury. And the mason, Robert Woolston, who went on to build the new town bridge over the River Welland, and the carpenter, Charles Collins. Collins' work can also be seen currently in the High Street in Stamford as he worked on the timber framed front to Walker's bookshop. Glover returned to Norwich working for John Brown, and these are some of his plans for a church at Hainford, Burr Apton, the new courthouse at Swaffham, and another church at Denton. We know that these plans were drawn uh, by Glover because there are some distinctive markings. He used the interpunct between the headings on most of his plans. He had a distinctive sloping S here and here. And his numbers, his numerals corresponded to his later work. Now I want to move to Richard Newcomb and the land that he developed in Scotgate. Previous writers have suggested that Newcomb had some sort of grand plan to tidy up what was a very um, rundown area of Stamford. But in fact, as we will see now, he was only able to develop this area because a number of lucky consequences. This is the area in question, and it's taken um, from a drawing by Martin Smith, who took it from the uh, survey of Stamford by Knipe in 1833. The original survey is in the British Library, um, but Martin Smith uh, drew sections of the plan for his book, Stamford, There and Now. This is the old Great North Road and stagecoaches would have run to and from York in front of the large property called Rock Cottage, which was a seven bedroom mansion. You can also see the Green Man here, which still exists today. And to give you an idea of the accuracy of Knipe's 1833 survey, I want to point out the vertical yellow line here, this is a passageway that runs between the, um, uh, the Green Man and runs from Scotgate up to a lane at the back. This passageway still exists today and remains a right of way. The hatched area in yellow here is a wheelwright's barn occupied by a certain Henry Hayes. And I mention this because we can see later in a more detailed plan how accurate um, this was and how accurate Knipe was when he did the 1833 survey. Newcomb's father died in 1832 and this gave Richard Newcomb a bit more leeway to uh, invest in his own properties. He was sole proprietor of the Stamford Mercury after his father's death and in 1836 he bought the Green Man, the blue hatched area, bought the Green Man, the stables next door, and another plot next to that. And then in 1838, Glover's name came to the fore again in Stamford, when a bookseller started to sell lithographs of St. Michael's Church. 
taken from a drawing by George Glover um, after the work had been completed. I think this gives you an indication as to how good an architect, um, an artist and draftsman uh, Glover was. But also it put Glover back into Richard Newcomb's mind's eye. And then later that year, the large rock cottage, the seven bedroom house uh, in Scotgate came up for sale. It had been sold four years earlier to a Mr. Robert Nichols, a linen draper in St. Mary Street. However, he had now become bankrupt and I think Newcomb probably jumped at the opportunity to purchase this plot in what would have undoubtedly been a fire sale. Newcomb was so sure that he could buy this plot that in September 1838, he spoke with a future employee of the Stanford Mercury and told him that he was going to buy this property and move out of his rooms in the high street and go and live in Rock Cottage. And sure enough, when the auction came about later in October 1838, he bought Rock Cottage. But he also bought the linen draper shop in St. Mary's Street, which became part of his property portfolio. And you can still see that property today as it's now Sinclair's. When Charles Richardson took Newcomb to see his new property and handed over, he pointed out that it came with two other plots of land. And I want to talk about the plot in circle in red. This was a small plot that had been used um, for various, um, uh, various ways in the past, but it was now uh, planted with trees and encircled with a fence and a gate. I think Newcomb probably understood some of the history regarding this land, but he took a chance and he started immediately to build a house. By the middle of 1839, the house was half complete, but it came to the attention of the Marquis of Exeter, who believing that this was his manorial wasteland, took Newcomb to court for trespass. And the case was thrown out uh, and Newcomb continued to build um, his house. And we know it was completed by the end of 1839 because it features in an oil painting which sits in the town hall in Stamford. And this shows the Dragoon Guards marching a bull in Stamford. And this was the occasion of the last bull run in Stamford. But you can see behind the completed house, which we now know to be Clock House. It's a simple building, uh, two rooms downstairs, two rooms upstairs, a single story at the rear for the scullery and kitchen and a privy beyond. But I want you to note that it has a gable front and the windows and doors are covered with stone hood mouldings a feature that Glover used in his future properties, although quite common at the time as this is Gothic a revival type of building. My thought is that Glover probably designed this for Newcomb as a test before moving on to designing what would become Newcomb's new mansion rock house. A few months later, another property came up for sale. And this was a lucky chance for Newcomb, or no, although not for the owner. <clears throat> the owner was at the time the mayor of Stamford, and he had been out riding with the Cotsmore hands and fell off his horse and died. And as a result, his property portfolio was sold. You can see here that it's a property near to Rock Cottage has a pump of excellent water, and it's in the occupation of Henry Hayes, who I mentioned earlier. 
this particular plot was obviously very important to Newcomb because it gave him the run of land from the Green Man right up to the junction with Empingham Road. And it enabled him to uh, develop the land in whichever way he wanted to. And this is what he did. He built Rock Terrace, and then later 30 and 31 Scott Gate, which were two shop fronts with stables for the future rock house at the rear. You can see the clock house has been built, but you can also see that the other plot of land is a spinney. And that spinney uh, remains to this day, and there's a covenant on that plot that no buildings should be placed upon it. Within a, within a month of um, Newcomb obtaining the lease on this new plot of land, George Glover joined James William Pocock in Huntington as a partner. We will know later that he also designed Rock House. So at this time, he would have been able to demonstrate these two large commissions from Newcomb, both Rock House and Rock Terrace. But it may also have been um, pressurized for, uh, by Newcomb for Glover to become um, a partner rather than as a standalone architect as, as he was so young. Instead of building his new mansion, Newcomb wanted to make a profit being the businessman that he was. And so Rock Terrace was built first and this was the design uh, by George Glover. It has some classical features, the two properties at the end and the two in the middle face forward slightly and are flanked by Corinthian pilasters here, a pedimented roof, some arched windows and the doorways are arched. It's a very symmetrical bu building, uh, much more so than the other well-known terrace in Stamford, Rutland Terrace. And it made the most of the plot because he was able to squeeze 10 properties in this, within this area. Glover incorporated a half basement for all of the properties in Rock Terrace. And by putting in footwells at the front and rear, Windows were placed, uh, enabling light to flood into the scullery at the rear and the kitchen at the front. The scullery had a small fireplace and the kitchen had a large kitchen range. But Glover also incorporated a small window in the pantry, enabling light to flood through the scullery into the pantry during the day. And he also incorporated a ventilation grill underneath the front steps, enabling the food in the larder to be kept cool. The maid of all works would have slept in the kitchen and coal was delivered into the coal room through a hatch at the ground floor. There was a dining room and a drawing room on the ground floor and Glover cleverly incorporated very large floor to ceiling wooden pocket doors, enabling the two rooms to be used as one. Upstairs, there were two bedrooms with fireplaces and a third bedroom without. Externally, Glover incorporated wrought iron Juliet balconies to the front and rear of each property. And in the middle two properties, there was a balcony with a metal plate showing the initials RN for Richard Newcomb, above which was a pediment. You can see some of the features that Glover used in this building and in his future buildings. He made use of Corinthian pilasters. He often used overhanging eaves, here supported by wooden modillions. 
And these two blind brick window panels are decorative. They're not to avoid the hearth text. And again, Glover used these in his future properties. And here you can also see the at the end, the arch window and the arch doorway. Internally, you can see one of the sliding pocket doors, cleverly concealed when not in use with a hinged cover, which could be pulled out with a ring pull. The doors slid on the grass, brass, pl uh, brass plate. And he here is one of the original fireplaces. I think there are only two left on the terrace at the moment white marble surround and a black fireplace with inset tiles. And here you can see the simple wooden banister rail with simple square spindles. Now I mentioned earlier that there was a good water source in the land that Newcomb bought. And here is indeed on the plan, which is attached to the lease in the uh, Brands Hospital lease book at Lincoln Archives. You can see the placement of the pump. But you can also see here the wheelwright's barn. And as I mentioned earlier, that shows you the accuracy of Knight's 1833 plan, because this was a a later plan drawn to scale. This is the, the town plan drawn up in 1886 by the Ordnance Survey, and it shows very clearly the detail of the 10 houses in Rock Terrace. This is Scott Gate, and this is what now known as Rock Road. Scottgate is much lower than Rock Road. And this line here is a retaining wall for the garden. And the gardens rose up to some steps. And then you had to climb the steps to exit onto Rock Road. So it gives you an idea how much higher Rock Road was. But there's some other steps here. These steps don't go up, they in fact go down. And they go down into a vaulted brick room, which Glover built over the pump. And this enabled the tenants of Rock Terrace to access fresh water whenever they wished. This room wasn't discovered until the 1970s when the owner of number seven had to call out the council to investigate a drainage problem and they dug down and I think they hit the roof and that when they investigated further they found um, they found the chamber. Unfortunately when they finished the work they covered everything over, sealed it off and it remains under the gardens of number six and number seven rock terrace and unfortunately they didn't take any photographs so we don't know what it looked like. Once Woolston had finished the heavy work on Rock Terrace, he moved across the road, demolished Rock Cottage and started to build Newcomb's fantastic new mansion. This is the ground floor plan of Rock House. And you can see here, large entrance for hall and then a large stairwell in the middle. This is what it would have looked like. And this is probably the earliest photograph of Rock House, maybe even as early as 1863. And I say that because above the front door, there is a funeral hatchment. And in 1863, Robert Nicholas Newcomb, the nephew and heir of Richard Newcomb died. And to give you an example of how the Newcomb family was seen in Stamford. Um, he was carried from the house up Casterton Road to the cemetery, and he was followed by over 2,000 people. 
Here I've stitched together two different plans. One is the 1886 detailed town plan, which finishes here. And the other is the 25 inch to one mile 1887 plan. And I've added it because I want to show how besides the ornament, besides the ornamental garden here, I think the land um, that was owned by Newcomb um, and Rock House extended to an orchard here and some pasture land here. And you can still see the deline delineation today because there's a jitty, <coughs> excuse me, there's a jitty that runs from Casterton Road up to Ratcliffe Road. I want you to pay, uh, I want to expand on this area here because Glover incorporated an in and out carriageway with stone piers and a wrought iron gate. And this is what it would have looked like with mature trees, the stone piers and the wrought iron gates. This uh, photograph was probably taken in the late 1930s, but you can see how magnificent the building must have been. As I've mentioned before, Glover had a classical training and where he had a, um, uh, a wealthy benefactor giving him a good commission, he could incorporate some of his classical features into the buildings. Here, you can see the use of Corinthian plasters here, here, two here, two more, and another on the corner. The use of arched windows, pedimented roof, and another pediment here. But he also incorporated this square cupola, which provided light to the stairwell below. And this was the view from my bedroom in Rock Terrace when I lived there. Internally, luckily, many of the original features still exist. Here you can see the lay light, uh, providing light from the cupola above, the more ornate metal spindles to the uh, staircase. And on the right, you can see the ornate plaster ceiling in the entrance hall. At the foot of the stairwell, there's an original uh, fireplace in what was probably white marble in the Greco-Egyptian style. Uh, and in the middle, you can see the coat of arms of the Newcomb family. The green, uh, the blue tiles would have been inserted at a later date. Now, as we've seen, Glover joined William Poke, James William Pocock as a partner in his practice in Huntington in 1840, and he immediately started to work. And the first plans he drew up were for some almshouses. Although the plans were drawn up in 1840, these almshouses weren't in fact built to 1847. But you can see here, um, the uh, draftsmanship and artistry of George Glover. But you also see the gabled front ends and the stone hood mouldings, which are reminiscent of Clock House, which was built a year before these designs were made. This is probably the earliest um, plan in existence by George Glover, once working on his own account. And the, the, this particular drawing together with the detailed plans um, are held by the National Archives at Kew. A year later, he designed the National School at Wistow. And again, you can see the gabled end and the stone hood mouldings. And then in 1841, they had a a larger commission to build a new parsonage at Great Paxton. When I discovered this building, I contacted the current owner and he invited me to visit. 
but he also told me that um, he believed they had some original secondary glazing. I found this very hard to believe because I can't find any reference to domestic secondary glazing at this time. However, when I look more closely at the plans, I can see that in the three main uh, living rooms on the ground floor, there were indeed larger, uh, wider um, window openings with more lines drawn compared to the domestic areas, such as the kitchen on the, on the right, which has a much narrower um, um, window. And sure enough, when I visited, I could see for myself the secondary glazing. And what struck me was this hinged panel and this ring pool, reminiscent of these, this, the detail on the pocket doors at Rock Terrace, built around the same time. Cleverly, the windows dropped down into a pocket below the main window. And then in 1841, he was a busy man, um, whilst Rock Terrace was being built, he married Ma Anne Pocock, the daughter of his partner, James William. And then in 1842, the partnership won a competition to design a new literary and scientific institution in Huntington. Again, you can see here the classical influences giant Corinthian pilasters, the pediment above the front door, the overhanging eaves, and he added a statue of Minerva. This building still exists today, uh, but it's been renamed Commemoration Hall, and it's situated in the High Street in Huntington. A year later, Glover designed two more National schools, again, gabled ends and stonehood mouldings in the uh, Gothic revival style. Now, towards the end of the work that Newcomb was developing, uh, Scott Gate, I mentioned the 30 and 31, and you can see, <clears throat> you can see here the two front uh, shop fronts, and this would have been the stables behind for Rock House. But if you look closely, there are some windows just underneath the arch. And these are the rear windows of four houses that were built on Rock Road. Newcomb, or D. Glover, cleverly arched the stables and then built four houses above them, making the most of the, the most use of the land that he had, providing him with additional income. Again, there are some Glover influences here, the overhanging eaves with modillion, uh, wooden modillion supports, the pediment, and here the arched windows, which match the arched windows in Rock Terrace. So I think all in all, it was probably Glover that designed these last two uh, de developments within Scottgate. But it all started to go wrong in 1845. The builder and the carpenter Collins uh, hadn't been paid fully by Richard Newcomb. He had held 1,400 pounds and they had no alternative but to take Newcomb to court. And this was the first uh, court case in uh, 1845. Uh, and this is taken from an article in the Lincolnshire Chronicle. And it was this article that identified Glover as the architect of Rock House and Rock Cottage. Um, uh, and the, the architect had been previously unknown. You can see that the article's in the Lincolnshire Chronicle and not the Stamford Mercury, because Richard Newcomb obviously didn't want to advertise the fact 
when he was being taken to court. The problem arose because rather than putting the, these buildings out to tender, he agreed a rate per measure. That meant that once the buildings were complete, the architect would measure up the work carried out by Collins and Wollstone, apply the rate to those measurements and enable Collins and Wollstone to bill Richard Newcomb. However, Newcomb didn't believe the calculations <coughs> and he felt that there had been collusion between the plaintiffs and the architect. And this must have been a um, uh, not a good experience for Glover, uh, as it would have cast him in a bad light. But it's interesting that the newspaper themselves say that instead of attributing this error to his inexperience in matters of this kind, Mr. Newcomb imagined that there must have been some collusion. So we can't be sure whether there was or not but the case wasn't resolved for another two years um, when Newcomb was forced to pay 1,000 of the 1,400 pounds. However, I think the damage had been done because within a few months of that initial court case, the partnership between James William Pocock and George, Hunt, uh, George Glover had been dissolved. Unfortunately, we don't know whether this was George protecting his father-in-law from any future fallout or whether it was uh, James Pocock um, being concerned by the actions of his son-in-law uh, and may have been aware of the future debt problems. Glover was forced to move back to Norwich and John Brown gave him some work. But then in 1847, as we said at the beginning, he was imprisoned for um, as an insolvent debtor. Um, luckily, he was released after one month. So I assume that his family paid whatever debts were due. And in 1848, he then moved to Lowestoft, where he remained for the rest of his life, almost. But once his... Um, wife Anne died, he decided to move back to Norwich and lived in the area he'd lived in before. Um, and then two years before he died, he donated a book to the British Architectural Library at Reba. This is the book in question. It was written by Palladio in 1560, around 1560 in Italy, and wasn't fully translated into English until 1721. And this is the second edition um, of that translation. And there were only 140 odd subscribers for the second edition. And Newcomb had one, uh, sorry, Glover had one of these copies. They're very rare. And in fact, if you would try to buy one of the 142 second edition copies today, it would cost you in excess of £15,000. <coughs> a few years later, another book was published in the 1730s, late 1730s or 1740s. And this book came up for auction recently. And it's interesting because it also shows that it was signed by George Glover of Lowestoft. So this was another classical architecture book that was owned by Glover, again, indicating his, his love for that style. So what is Glover's legacy in Stanford? Well, if you believe as I do that he designed the clock house, that's now a listed grade two building. It was beautifully renovated in 2018 and sold in 2019 for over 400,000 pounds. And I believe it's now used as an Airbnb. And then we come to Rock Terrace, built in 1841. It had an interesting history 
in that the Newcomb family owned all 10 freeholds until they sold them in 1919. The freeholds were bought by the Potter family, um, a printer in Stanford. And again, the Potter family held them in their entirety as an investment until 1946. It was then that they started to sell off the freeholds on a piecemeal basis. The last was sold in 1967. So you can see that from probably from 1946 uh, onwards, there was gradual gentrification where the new freehold owners were able to make modifications to the internal layout of the buildings. And this is when fireplaces started to be ripped, ripped out and basement walls started to be knocked down. When the last property was bought in 1967, um, it was in its almost original state. It had no electricity, had no internal bathroom, no internal lavatory, and the basement would have been in its um, original layout. The people that bought the property in 1967, in fact, still live there 56 years later. If you wanted to buy one of these properties today, it would cost you in excess of three quarters of a million pounds, and they're all private residences. And finally, uh, Glover's mansion built for Richard Newcomb himself, also a grade two listed building. Over the years, it's had various uses. Um, it remained uh, home to Newcomb uh, family members uh, until eventually it was then let. And it continued to be let to wealthy individuals until 1919, when the current tenant at that time, Mr. Martin, who was Lord Mayor of, uh, sorry, Mayor of Stanford, purchased the freehold. He remained there for a few more years until he died. The building then became used as an office and then during the Second World War, it became the headquarters of the Polish Parachute Regiment. And then it reverted to offices. And then last year it was sold for one and a half million pounds. And there's planning permission submitted by the new owners to make it into a boutique hotel. So we'll all be able to go in and see those original features. This was truly a magnificent building. Um, of its time. And you don't have to take my word for that, um, but that of the Professor Curl, who regards it as one of the finest essays in classicism of its time anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, that was amazing. I think it's so good when somebody finds out something new. I was trying to find um, our research that we'd done on Wykenham House because I was convinced that there was something I could share with you. But all I could share was that um, when we did all our research, um, uh, we um, came across a box in um, the museum um, that was part of, well, it was in the library. They brought a box out and it was all about the architect Edward Browning. And it got a, yeah. list, it got a list of all his buildings and everything and I've just looked at one of them and it says rock house rock terrace architect unknown but that was yeah. from 10 years ago so yeah. I was thinking no we know where it is that's amazing so um well done yeah it wasn't um, it wasn't it wasn't known until I wrote the book yeah that's what I was thinking so um it's so brilliant to have that there um I've just got one question John and um, what next oh I, um, I'm going to have a rest, I think. Okay. I like the research. I like the research, but the writing's tough. Yes. OK. Well, John, thank you so much. And um, we hope to see you with your next project. Thank you very much.